All right. So today, what we are going to do is to start in uh, looking at what a CMOS inverter should look like, what an inverter should look like, and then in particular to see how we would realize such an inverter in CMOS logic. Okay. So the first thing before we get to that is we already know that the whole of the digital IC design course and digital design in general is built around mostly the idea of binary logic. Right, binary value logic, zeros and ones. So we are going to make the assumption over here that zero corresponds to a zero volt and one corresponds to a voltage of three dB or a high voltage. Okay, the supply voltage. Right? Conventionally V D is used to refer to the supply voltage in CMOS circuit. Why? Because it's connected to the the drain terminals are connected over here. Right? That's towards the top of the Okay. So now that we have uh, DVD as one and ground as zero, okay. The first question that we can ask ourselves is, what should an inverter behave like? Okay. What is the expected behavior? If I see the zero over here, I expect to see a one at the output, and if I see the one on the input, I expect to see a zero on the output. Okay. Now, what does that mean in terms of the characteristics? What we can do is, since after all, the real system is not just a two-valued logic, right? It's not. It doesn't have just zero and VGD. It also has to go through the voltages in between. Okay. This means that you can define something called the voltage transfer characteristic. or a VTC, which is essentially a plot of the output voltage versus the input voltage. Right? Now what we have said in the previous diagram is when the input is zero, the output should be VDD and when the input is VDD, the output should be zero. Okay, so we know that these two points must lie on the VTC. What should the rest of the VTC look like for an ideal inverter? First of all, what should it look like to be an inverter at all? As long as these two points are satisfied, can we straight away say that yes, it's an inverter under all conditions? Strictly speaking, yes because you are only interested in those two points of operation, right? So let's say that you have some kind of behavior which even looks something like this. Strictly going by the definition of an inverter, this is an inverter. Okay, there is nothing wrong with this kind of a behavior. Okay? But in practice we know that this is not a, definitely not a desirable behavior for an inverter. Alright, so in this case, what do we have instead? Huh? What about a straight line joining these two points? Is this an inverter? Why not? Huh? Even practically, what is the problem with it? Well, it depends on how you use it, right? Supposing I give an input which is either on or off, the output is going to be on or off. So what is it about this particular characteristic which made it? It is switching. If I give it 0, it will show output of 1. If I give it 1, it will show an output of 0. Why do you say it not? Yeah, if it has a specific input, it will give you a specific output. Is that necessarily wrong? Huh? Slow you can't say. How do you know that it's slow? Again, that, that, that has nothing to do with the VTC. This is a, a static characteristic. This is a DT characteristic, right? If I give this voltage, this is out. It doesn't have anything to do with the speed. So what we are talking about over here is something else which is a slightly more complicated thing called the noise market. Right? 
because in a practical system you are going to end up having not just clean exact zeros and ones you will end up with a noisy input so the input instead of being exactly zero will be maybe 0.1 volt 0.2 volt something like that or it will be flicker zero plus minus some small amount you don't want the output to flicker the same way okay but at some point when the input changes sufficiently i want the output to change and to remain at the other value okay now close to vdd let's say the vdd is 1.8 volt even if it drops to 1.7 1.6 and so on i don't want it to immediately go back to zero now as i'm going from zero to 1.8 what should be the ideal switching point at which i say okay this is no longer a low input the input is now looking like it's high i need to switch over and make the output low what should be that switching point ideally vdd by 2 okay this is the intuition there's no hard and fast rule as far as this is concerned but intuitively you can understand why this is the case right i am i have a situation where the inverter is not getting a clean input it's not getting only zero or one okay keep in mind if you are giving a clean input zero or one this is a valid inverter there's nothing wrong with it okay the problem is in practice you cannot give clean zero or one so if there is any noise associated with it you want that noise to get suppressed or it affects to go away. for doing that in the ideal situation what i would like is this kind of a vdd right this point being vdd by 2 So now what happens? Anywhere from zero up to 0.9 volts, if the input changes, it doesn't matter. As far as this inverter is concerned, it reaches at the logic zero at the input and gives you a clean logic one at the output. Okay. Anywhere above 0.9, even 0.91, right? It immediately switches over to the other side and says, okay, this is the logic high. Now this is not like a Smith trigger. Smith trigger has the so-called hysteria system. So we are not talking about anything like that over here, right? We are talking about a clean threshold. You cross the threshold, output becomes low. You go below the threshold, input is treated as low, and therefore output becomes high. Okay. So this is the so-called brick wall VTC. Right? It's called a brick wall for obvious reasons. It looks like a brick wall. Right? It's very sharp up to a certain point and then abruptly drops it. Okay. Now in practice, we can never get a brick wall VTC because among other things, it is not differentiable. Right? At those at that point, at VDD by two, it's a continuous function, yes, but it's not differentiable. So it's not really a physical function, so to speak. Right? So in practice, what you'll end up with would be something that looks. the best approximation that you can get would be something that looks a bit more like this okay this is a good approximation and ultimately this is what we would like to make okay we would like to create some logic circuit which would have this kind of a behavior okay all right so now the question becomes how do we do this right how do we construct a circuit which has this kind of a behavior which initially for small values of input gives a logic high at the output and for large values of input gives a logic low at the output okay before getting to that there are a couple of other specific parameters that i want to define which will be used later okay one of them of course is this point over here the switching pressure right for a so called brick wall inverter it's very easy to define the switching pressure you just see the point that it is switching right but for this continuous or rather the continuously the smoothly varying vtc 
how do I define the sitting pressure? How do I say which point is the sitting pressure? Exactly. Right? So you consider the condition B output is equal to B input. Because that is the point at which the inverter is switching. Right? From being logic lower the input, logic higher the output to being both equal and from there onwards logic higher the input, logic lower the output. Okay? So if I take this line and consider its intersection with this, this point over here. I call Vn the midpoint voltage. Okay? Okay. Now, apart from this, there are four terms VOS and VOL. VIS and VIS. Okay? Now VOS and VOL are from the VTC essentially looking at it and saying, okay, what is the logic output height that is given by this inverter? Okay? That is to say, if I give it a clean input of 0, what is the best output that I get for this inverter? In this case, what is it? VD. Okay, from this diagram at least VOS is equal to VD. Right? So these are the actual output high and low values. Right? What are the values that are actually high and low according to this VD? Right? VIS and VIL are talking about a slightly different thing. VIS is effectively asking what is the highest or the lowest input voltage which will still be treated as a logic high by this inverter. Okay? The lowest input voltage, think about it, is the lowest input voltage which will be treated as a logic high by this inverter. So the ideal inverter, what is that value? VDD by 2, right? Because anything above VDD by 2 is to be treated as logic high. Same way, VIL is the highest input voltage which will still be treated as a logic low. Okay? So the highest voltage which is treated as a logic low or the lowest voltage which is treated as a logic high are VIL and VIS respectively. For the ideal inverter, both are equal to VDD by 2. Okay? For the practical inverter, what is it? How do we define this? Just like we define that VM as the intersection with the VO equal to VI curve, VI, VI line, right? We need some better practical way of defining VIH and VIS so that we can actually measure it from the graph, right? Because saying that, okay, this is the highest voltage which is treated as a logic low, how do I know at what point it is not treating it as a logic low anymore? Okay? I am going along this red curve over here, the VTC, the actual physical VTC, and at some point I have to say, okay, now I am no longer treating this input as a logic low, but it's not that the output has become high. Okay? In fact, there is some transition region for this where I should actually say the input is neither low nor high. Because it doesn't make sense for the input to be in that way. It's not easy to say whether it's a low or a high. Okay. So for that, can you think of any way by which you would define this which would be useful, which would be easy to sort of measure? Okay. 
okay the principle used behind this is i'll define something as a log- logic law provided that any perturbation around that logic law gets suppressed even more at the output okay so let's say i am at point 1 volt and i have some point 05 volt dvs right i am at point 1 volt so the output will not be exactly 1.8 it might be some 1.75 or something like that okay but now there is a point 05 volt deviation at the input i don't want a large deviation at the output i want it to be even smaller than what is the deviation at the input less than 0.05 volt if that happens i'll say look i'm still at a low voltage okay whereas let's say i have moved to something like 0.4 volts at the input okay from 0.4 volts i make a deviation of 0.05 okay i'm at 0.4 volts at the input according to this diagram 0.4 volts will probably give me an output still around 1.6 or so right but now 0.4 plus 0.05 the output instead of just remaining 1.6 minus something less than 0.05 it becomes something greater than 0.05 so 1.6 minus 0.1 let's say okay that means that the output is changing faster or by a larger amount than the perturbation in the input that's not good news right it sort of defeating the purpose of the inverter the inverter was supposed to give me a clean output even though it had an noisy input at which point on this curve does this happen the slope right dvo by dvi right dvo that is delta in vo for a given delta in vi as long as that quantity is smaller than minus 1 and it's, it's of course negative we know that because of the shape of the curve right but as long as its magnitude is less than 1 we know that for a given change in input the change in output is going to be even small whereas if that magnitude becomes greater than 1 then for a given change in input the magnitude becomes larger the output becomes the output change becomes larger right so if i go to this graph i can identify two points over here right those two values right i'll just redraw the diagram point here is the highest <coughs> input which is still being seen as a logic low okay it is vil and this point over here is the lowest input which is still being seen as a logic high it is vil so what we have in other words is given a voltage transfer characteristic which i either analytically derive or let's say i measure it right by actually sort of giving different inputs and seeing what the output is i measure this plot it on a graph now on that graph i can go and you know essentially fly the slope minus 1 line and find out that this point is intersects that characteristic and say okay this point is vis this point is vis okay now with that in mind what we also have is this over here is vos 
and this over here is VOA. Right? They are actually depend on the y axis, but if I put it on the x axis, then these are the points where it will be. Right? So now what we are saying is this entire region here is logic 1. And this entire region here is logic 0. Okay? And those regions are basically referred to as the noise margin. Okay? Not, not those regions as such, but the width of the region. Okay? So, VOS minus VIS is the upper noise margin, VO, VIL minus VI, VOL is the lower noise margin. Okay? What does that mean? It means that that much noise is permitted on the input before it stops being treated as an input high or input low, respectively. Okay? Again, for the ideal inverter, what would the noise margins be? What would the width of those regions be? Divided really by two. Okay? But in practice, because it will be a continuous or rather differentiable voltage transfer characteristic, what we will find is that there will be two specific points where you can find the slope of minus one. Okay. From that you can find VIH and VIL and therefore define the noise margin. It will not be exactly VDD by 2, it will be something smaller than that. But your goal as a designer will obviously be how do I make it as large as possible. You don't want it to be a small quantity. You want it to be as large as possible, as close to VDD, as VDD by 2 as possible. Okay? Alright. So now with all of these definitions, so we know what the VM is, the midpoint voltage, we know what the noise margins are, we know what the overall voltage transfer characteristic looks like. Let's look at how we are going to realize this using CMOS logic. Okay? Now one word before we go into CMOS logic. So far I talked about the NMOS transistor. Right? We have its VGS, VDS, ID flows in this direction. Okay? VT of the NMOS transistor is a positive quantity. Okay? And Kn is equal to mu n. P of W by S. Right? Again a possible quantity. Now what happens for a PMOS transistor is that structurally first of all as far as the schematic symbol is concerned the only difference we make for this especially for digital circuit is simply this. Okay? We don't bother with putting the arrows and so on. We are primarily just concerned with the behavior of the thing itself. So you keep the, and typically digital circuits tend to have a lot of transistors in them. So you keep the diagram as simple as possible. Okay? You just draw it in this way. This, with that circle, that bubble over there at the gate, is a PMOS transistor. Okay? Typically, the source will be the upper terminal. Again, like I said, the source and drain are completely symmetric, so it doesn't really make sense to talk about the upper or lower terminal. But, going by the convention that upper, volta upper terminal corresponds to higher voltage, the source will be at the, the upper terminal, because it will be at the higher voltage. Okay. What happens to this? The bulk terminal for PMOS is connected to VD. Unlike an NMOS where it is connected to ground. 
Okay. Usually, VS is also at VT. Right? It is the most positive terminal in the circuit, which means that VGS and VDS are actually speaking less than zero, they are negative quantity. Right? Similarly, voltage threshold, threshold voltage of the PMOS is that negative voltage which is applied across the gate to source, right? Or in other words, the positive voltage from source to gate, which will cause inversion. How does inversion happen in the PMOS? The substrate is n type. So, what needs to happen is that the substrate being n type, I need to invert it. I need a majority of holes to come at that interface. Okay, so I need to apply a negative voltage at the gate terminal. Okay, so VTP also has to be less than zero, and KP this is also typically considered a negative quantity, but that's just because of the direction of the current. Right, if we consider the ID as the drain to source current. Right? Then it is negative. What I am going to do as far as this course is concerned is everywhere we will work only with the magnitudes of these values. Right? So unless otherwise specified, I am writing only the magnitude. Okay. What that means is I now need to be careful to make sure that I am writing VSG instead of VGS, VSG instead of VDS and so on. Okay. The best way to understand this is to sort of look at the circuit, think about intuitively what are the voltages applied across it, what is the current that, what is the direction of the current that is going to flow through it and how can I write out the equations corresponding to that. Okay. If you have any confusion, then you can go back to the raw equation, write out everything with the proper sign. Okay? But as far as this course, as far as the class is concerned, I will just be proceeding by considering the magnitude. Okay? So, even if I write only VGA for this, it actually means magnitude of VGA. Okay? So, please keep that in mind. I keep interchanging, but for the most part, I will try to be clear as far as possible using the magnitude signs and so on. But it becomes very clumsy after a while going on putting magnitude for every single symbol. Right? So, unless otherwise specified, it essentially implies that we are considering only the magnitude. Okay? That's the one thing to keep in mind as far as the PMOS transistor is concerned. That's the only problem here. Right? Otherwise, the equations, the derivation, the behavior, everything is exactly the same as NMOS. The only real difference is this new P value. Right? The mobility in the case of the NMOS trans uh, the PMOS transistor, the mobility of holes, is roughly half to one third of that of the electron. Okay? For this course, again, we will take it as a rough estimate that it is half. Right? So, for the most part over here, I am following the treatment in Wesley and Harris. Right? In the book by Wesley and Harris, I have given you the reference books at the beginning of the, in the first class. The two sort of best reference books for this course, one is Rabbi Chandrakarshan and Nicholas. The other is Wesley, Harris and uh, Banerjee. Okay? So, the Wesley Harris book is the one that we are going to be following for a lot of this treatment because it has a little bit more intuitive treatment of many of these uh, factors. Okay. All right. So now, what does a CMOS inverter look like? Right. Okay. First thing is we want the behavior to be this kind of characteristic, ok. We have one input, one output, one VDD and one ground. 
I need to connect the transistors in between that input and output such that they realize the behavior that I want. Okay? So, before going to the transistor level treatment, I am just going to draw this in terms of switches and then replace those switches with transistors. Right? So, what I would like to see is the VI when it is high, it should be able to turn on a switch which will take the output to zero. Okay? So, in other words, there should be a switch over here which is controlled by VI. But when VI is low, I don't want the output to just be floating, I want it to actually get pulled up to VDD. Okay? So I need to have another switch. But now that switch will behave the other way. This switch will be active when VI is low. Right? As long as I can get this kind of a behavior, I have actually got my ideal VT. Right? Because as long as the input is high, the lower switch is going to be on, pulling the output down to zero. During that time, I am assuming that the other switch, right, the negated switch, is going to be off. And similarly, when the input is low, that negated switch, the one on top, is going to be active. It will pull the output voltage up to VGD. The other switch will be off. What happens if both switches are on at a given time? I have contention, I have a short circuit from VGD to cross. Okay? Now, I should not let that happen. Okay? It will happen to some extent in practice. Question is, what can I do to sort of avoid that and prevent any problems? With? So now that I know what these switches should behave like, I know what to put in over there. Right? These switches exactly look like NMOS and CMOS transistors respectively. So the circuit then becomes one NMOS transistor over here going to ground. A CMOS transistor going to VDD. Both of them connected to this VI, and this point itself is directly the output VA. Okay. Now the next question, of course, becomes. What does the voltage transfer characteristic of this look like? How do we derive any useful parameters regarding this? And from there on, where do we go? Right? What else can we analyze about this CMOS inverter? Okay. So, first things first, I am going to qualitatively draw what the voltage transfer characteristic looks like. And we are going to try and identify the different regions of operation of the two transistors as we sort of go through different phases of this. So, I am going to up front tell you that the diagram looks something like this. So, keep in mind that this actually goes to zero, right? There is no tending towards zero. The most common mistake that I see people doing when asked about the CMOS characteristics is that lower part never actually goes and hits zero. It does, because once it goes above a certain point, one of the transistors is going completely into cutoff. There is no further current. Right? The voltage is actually zero, the output voltage. Right? So let's look at the various regions of operation, so to say. Right? 
initially I have very small input voltage. What happens to the two transistors? There is an NMOS and there is a PMOS. What about the NMOS? What does the NMOS behave like? It is in cutoff. Right? Very small input voltage. The input voltage is directly applied to the gate of that transistor of both transistors. Right? The input voltage for the NMOS is very small. NMOS is going to be cut off. Okay? What about the PMOS? At this time, what is the voltage? What are the voltages across the PMOS? V S G, that is the source to gate voltage. Is that's the positive quantity over here, right? Or alternatively, magnitude of V G S for the PMOS is it's greater than V T. Okay, how much is it? It's V G D minus V S. Okay. This is always true. Okay. So for VI being small, the VGS across the PMOS transistor is large. It is inverted. Okay. So channel inversion has taken place, channel is present as far as the PMOS is concerned. What about the VDS? Huh? It's close to zero. It may not be exactly zero, but it will be close to zero. It depends on what the value is. Actually, in this case, it is zero, right? Because the NMOS is cut off. As long as the NMOS is cut off, there can be no current flowing through the transistor, flowing, uh, flowing through both the transistors. As long as there is no current through the PMOS, right? The PMOS also, the VDS across it is zero. Okay. Now, what condition does that correspond to? Is it linear region or is it saturation or is it velocity saturation? Linear, right? Because the VMIN, the minimum among VGS, VDCAT and VDS is VDS. So, it is a linear region. Now, that is true even though the PMOS has got the VDS of 0. 0 is still the minimum, right? The reason why it is called the linear region is because any change in VDS at that point will cause the current to flow according to that linear region equation. Okay. So, NMOS is cut off, CMOS is linear to start with. What happens as I increase the voltage still further to so some point let us say over here? What is the importance of that point? It must be greater than VT of the NMOS transistor because that is the first point at which something changes. Right? Until, as long as I am less than VT of that NMOS transistor, no current is going to flow. The PMOS has to remain in the linear region, NMOS has to remain in cutoff. Okay? But I cross VTN. What happens? Immediately at that point, the NMOS turns on. Okay? Now what are the values across the NMOS transistor? It has got a VGS which is equal to whatever is the small voltage, but VGS minus VT is positive, yes. Is it a small or a large quantity? I have just crossed it. So, it is a small quantity, right. So, VGS minus VT is still small. What is VDS across the NMOS? It is a large voltage. It is zero. It is close to VT. Okay. And VD fat, as we saw last time, you know, approximately 0.6 volts are there about. Right? So, let us consider the case where VGS minus VT is less than 0.6 volts. During that time, in which mode is the, uh, is the transistor working? Saturation, not velocity saturation, saturation itself. Okay? What about the theme of? Still linear. Right? Because nothing much has changed over there. The VDS has only changed slightly. Okay. Now, let us get to some point like this midpoint voltage over here. 
Now things are slightly different. The voltage is sufficiently high, VGS is sufficiently high that VGS minus VT is no longer a small quantity. I can't straight away sort of, you know, say that that's the smallest of the three and so on. In fact, most likely, because assuming that, you know, I have a supply voltage of 1.8 volts and that Vm is close to 0.9, what I can expect is that the VD starts, or rather v, Gs minus Vt, right? Maybe close to VD sat or less than VD sat. Right? Or it could be greater than VD sat. Okay. The exact numbers I will give you later when we work it out. For the time being, let's assume that VGS minus VT is greater than VD sat. Okay? It depends on the exact numbers, of course, but assuming that VGS minus VT is greater than VD sat, what do we have over there? The NMOS has moved into velocity saturation. Right? What about the PMOS? The PMOS is also in a pretty much the same state. Right? It has now got, now look at this point. This point is essentially the place where both the PMOS and the NMOS have the same value of VGS, VDS, etc. So whatever is there for the NMOS is the same behavior for the PMOS as well. Okay? So it's very likely that the PMOS is also has moved into velocity saturation. From linear, it straight away moved into velocity saturation. Okay? Go still further. Now what happens is, at some point, the NMOS, I increase the VGS across it significantly, right? I reach, let's say, this point out here. Now, Vds becomes the minimum of the value. That is, the V output has dropped so much that the Vds across the NMOS is now the minimum among those three values. The NMOS has now moved into the linear region. And the PMOS What's going to happen to the PMOS? It has now got a very small value of VGS minus VT. Right? Because my input has come somewhere out here. Okay? And because of the small value of VGS minus VT, that is the minimum among those three quantities, the PMOS goes into saturation. No longer velocity saturation. And finally, the last stage is, once I cross Vt of the PMOS, the NMOS remains in linear and the PMOS goes into cutoff. Okay? So, these are the different sort of regions of operation that we can identify for the two transistors as we sort of feel through the voltage transfer characteristic, right? Remember, this is a static characteristic. There is no question of speed over here. I am not interested in how quickly this transition takes place. I am assuming that at least point, I apply the input, I wait for everything to settle down, then I measure the output current, output voltage, etc. Okay? So, this is a static characteristic. Under these conditions, this is how the different regions of operation for the two transistors are and this is how the overall derivation, you know, any, any further characteristics that we want to derive for this system can come from here. Okay? Alright. Now, this sort of gives us enough information to tell this region of operation the transistor is in that will sort of help us to you know get some kind of a rough estimate of the behavior. Another intuitive way of sort of looking at the same thing is the so called load curve characteristic. Right? That's another way of deriving the same voltage transfer characteristic. What we say over there is I'll plot the 
ID versus VDS for different values of VDS of the NMOS and the PMOS. But what I do is, because I know that VDS of NMOS plus VDS of PMOS must be equal to VDD, the total, right? So as far as the PMOS is concerned, I just draw it sort of backwards on the same axis, but with the y-axis on the right hand side and the input increasing or rather the VDS increasing from right to left. If that happens, its characteristic looks something like this. Right? Now, what we can do is, each point over here corresponds to a given value of VGS. Right? So that this point over here, let's say, corresponds to Let's say this corresponds to 1.5 volts. Okay. The corresponding line over here will be something else. So this VGS right, these two points correspond to this. Therefore, this intersection. is a point on the characteristic. Okay. In this way, this is another way by which we can sort of derive the same behavior. What we are saying is, the VGS of the NMOS transistor is actually the input voltage. The VDS of the NMOS transistor is the output voltage. Okay. We will end up with some kind of a curve which looks slightly different. It doesn't exactly look like that, but you can derive the exact points that you want just by superimposing these two curves. Okay. Then take the VDS value, the corresponding VDS that you have, plot it, you will get pretty much the same characteristic as what you see over here. Okay. That's just another way of doing the same thing, but graphically. Okay. In practice, as we will be doing in the once the assignments part, we typically use a simulation tool. Right? So, a quick word about simulation tools. We will be giving you an example, an uh, overview of that on Friday in the class. Right? And from then on, we will be having the assignment. One of the things you need to keep in mind, and one reason why I kept insisting that all of these equations are just approximations, you would have noticed that while writing the ID versus VGS or VDS, equation, I had a total of something like 5 parameters or so, right, that's mu n, c of, w l, v g s, v t, just those terms alone, right, less than 10 parameters. In practice, a spike simulation for every transistor considers literally hundreds of parameters, right. What are those hundreds of parameters? They include things like the doping concentration, the size of the extra overhang of the doping area, right? How much is the effective length versus the actual drawn length of the transistor? All of those things are made parameters in the spike simulation, which are neglected by our equation. Okay. So, spike has got a very detailed model of how the transistor works and has got input from very detailed characterization of actual process parameters. Okay. Which is why we consider that for the most part a spice simulation is accurate. Something that you get out of a spice simulation can be considered to be within around 5 to 10 percent of what you will get if you actually measure the circuit on silicon. Okay? Which is why for a large part as far as the rest of this course is concerned, we will be doing a lot of spice simulations to get a better understanding of what the numbers are. What we are doing over here are hand calculations which help you to understand the sort of broad sweep of how these things work, but not the nitty-gritty details. Okay?
All right, I'll stop there for today's class. Tomorrow we'll continue with the voltage transfer characteristics, derive the VM and the noise margins and so on.